good morning to all of you joining me live here at Facebook headquarters in sunny California. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of those who are joining us on this live broadcast today. Very excited to be with you today. My name is Terry McClements, and I'm the U.S. Human Capital Leader and the Global Talent Leader for PwC. And we're glad you're joining us to what proves to be a very robust discussion and topic that we hope that will continue throughout today and for many months and years to come. We've got hundreds, actually thousands of people joining us across the globe today. We've got 80 to 100 plus territories joining us in live conversations of webcasts on campus and with corporations to basically engage with this dialogue real time, alive. Today, we're really going to focus on one overall topic, which is about women and leadership. We can't just talk about women and leadership without recognizing the importance of the overall diversity that's important from an overall global business perspective. It's important that we bring all of our perspectives, whether it be men, women, different races, sexual orientation, different competencies and perspective to ensure we're bringing our best thinking to solve the most important complex problems of society. So with that, as we think about the overall uh, women in leadership discussion that we really want to drive into today, I thought it'd be good to share a little story. As I was thinking about coming out here, I have a PwC professional that I was working with at, with inside our organization. And about three years ago, she approached me to say she wasn't sure what she was going to do from her overall career aspirations. She was doing phenomenal work on our inside our company and serving her clients extremely well. At the same time, she was contemplating having children. And she wasn't sure at that time, could she manage to balance both? Could she have a great career and also manage children at the same time? So she reached out to me, knowing that I also had two children at the time and was managing to have a fulfilling career and a rewarding personal life as well. So I gave her my tips for how I made it successful. It just so happens at that same time, there was a college commencement speech from Barnard College that had gone viral. And I encouraged that professional to not just listen to me, but to also listen to that viral commencement speech. That speech was delivered by Sheryl Sandberg. And one of the key messages in that conversation was, don't leave before you leave. And as I interpret that concept of don't leave before you leave, it means don't take yourself out of the game because of something that might happen to you, of the what if scenario, but go in full bore to take advantage of all the opportunities that are ahead of you. So I encouraged her to listen to that, and I'm very excited to say that that speech inspired her to stay with us. And I'm even more excited to share with you that that person is about to make partner within our organization, and that is a huge step into the leadership organization of PwC. So, in addition to thinking about leadership as a role, at PwC, we also think about leadership as leading yourself and having the capability to drive your own career, your own trajectory. Leadership doesn't necessarily need to be a title. It's about how you take responsibility for yourself, and ultimately, when you're leading teams, how do you develop others on your team? So what I'd like to do right now is really get us into the topic of leadership and women, the real reason we're here today. And with that, I'd like to introduce Cheryl Sandberg, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Facebook. She's also the best-selling author of Lean In, Women, Work, and the <laughs> Will to Lead. She's just also introduced a next bestseller, which will be a bestseller, Lean In and Graduates. And this book does a phenomenal job in terms of explaining the important things that are important to know from a college graduate perspective in terms of significant career transitions. So with that, I'd love to introduce Cheryl Sandberg on stage with me to help us have a conversation around career <laughs> transitions from campus to college. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So I'm excited to have everyone here today. Uh, I know globally, I know it's different times of day for different people, but thank you for joining us for what I think is a really important conversation. So I wrote this book called Lean In because, and get ready for this shocker, the world is still run 
pretty much by men. And I'm just not sure it's going that well. <laughs> I think what really is important in getting to the kind of leadership we want all over the world is that we have to not just aspire to have real leadership from all different people of all different backgrounds and genders, but also we need to talk about gender. Because what I saw, and I'm almost 45, so I'm way older than uh, everyone here, but what I saw since I left college and came into the workforce is that progress for women in many ways really stagnated over the last decade, but no one was talking about it. I spent most of my professional career never mentioning the fact that I'm a woman, which I know shocks people because I talk about uh, issues for women all the time now, but for most of my career, I never spoke about it because that is not how you fit into a man's world. I thought if you said you were a woman, the person on the other side of the table would think you were, you know, complaining, whining, asking for special treatment, or worse yet, about to sue them. And I didn't want anyone to think any of that. And so I never talked about it. And really, no one was talking about it. It was as if the issues we had had on gender, the issues we had had on different race and backgrounds were over because no one was talking about them openly. And the problem is that that's not yielding progress. That if you look at women at the top of organizations, everything from the PWCs to the Facebook to every industry to every government in the world, we are not seeing real progress for women at the top, and we haven't in a decade. Women have had 15% of the corporate level, kind of corporate level executive jobs, C level jobs in the United States for 10 years. Women have had 17% of the board seats for 10 years. In every country in the world, women have less than 6% of the CEO jobs of the big companies. And those numbers are just not moving. And so what I think this meant is we needed to start talking about it, which is why I wrote Lean In, why we founded LeanIn.org, and our president, Rachel, uh, will be talking to you today, and why we're working so hard to get people into communities we call Lean In Circles, because we think this can help so much. If we're going to change this, it's going to take all of us. It's going to take great companies like PwC. I have been uh, so impressed, not just with PwC's involvement with Lean In, which has happened from the very beginning, but how concrete the actions have been. So when my book first came out, uh, the U.S. chair of PwC, Bob Mritz, I had never met him. He wrote a public letter to his top 400 executives asking them explicitly to mentor women and minorities, basically doing exactly what I thought needed to be done. Rather than pretending we're color or race blind because we're not, saying out loud, you know what? We're not getting enough women and minorities in senior jobs, and it is everyone's responsibility in those senior jobs here to change that. And so I'm asking you, my top 400 people, to take this on and do it yourself. And that was exactly the kind of corporate leadership I think is necessary, and I think we all need to do to put these issues on the table where we can deal with them. We need to understand the biases and the challenges people face. Lean In launched a campaign a couple months ago called Ban Bossy, talking about the word bossy. But it's a really good example of what goes wrong for women, and it goes wrong all over the world. All over the world. We never really call boys bossy, or very rarely, because when a boy leads, it's expected. But when a girl leads, it's negative. In fact, Lean In's now been translated into 27 languages. It's on its way to 40, so I've had a chance to think about this, the translations. And it turns out that every country in the world, every language, has a word or a phrase, which is the equivalent of bossy. It's the equivalent of a phrase or word which is basically used to tell little girls not to lead. A phrase or word that's almost never used for little boys, and it's completely universal. Those gender biases, unfortunately, don't stop at childhood, but they continue. My favorite latest story, not favorite because it's good, <laughs> favorite, favorite because it's so clear, comes from a man named Ben Bars. He's a professor at Stanford. And he wrote, he wrote an article talking about his experience because at 40, he changed from being barber to being, being Ben. So he went from being a woman to a man. And he said it was incredible. All of a sudden, everyone took him much more seriously. No one interrupted him. People actually walk up to him at conferences and say, you are a much better researcher than your sister Barbara ever was. <laughs> and so these expectations and these biases are so real. And they don't just hit gender, they hit race. They hit background. They hit nationality. And 
We have to talk about them. At Facebook, we have different affinity groups for people that come together. And there's an Asian American group and an Asian group. And I once saw them walking around. They all had buttons that said, I may or may not be good at math. <laughs> Basically saying, just because I'm Asian doesn't mean I'm good at math. We all organize the world. There's a lot of information coming at us along stereotypes. And those stereotypes really fall on gender, on race, on background, on ethnicity, on nationality. And that doesn't give us the room to be the individuals we need to be. And so Lena is about conquering that. And so much of the work PWC is, is about conquering that. I really believe that if this changes, you all are the most important. All the people in this room, all the people on this call, on this video stream, this will not change with my generation. It is over for my and Rachel's generation, and I am sad about that. <laughs> There's a lot of progress that can be made, but my generation is not going to get us close to 50-50 in leadership roles. But your generation can, because you are starting now. And so I'm going to share just a couple things I want you to know as you step into the workforce, as you graduate, as you finish your education. And then Rachel's going to come up and give you 10 tips that come from the recent work we've done for Lean In for Graduates on specific advice and then lots of ways to follow up. So things I want you to know. I want you to know you have choices and I want you not to limit yourself. Not to leave before you leave. I think you summarized my idea more succinctly than I ever have. <laughs> but don't leave before you leave is exactly about not putting the brakes on yourself, not limiting yourself for sacrifices you don't have to make yet. It started at Facebook. There was a young woman many years ago who came to see me and she was sitting right outside my, my desk and she kept asking me all these questions. And I said, well, you know, how do I do it? How do I do kids and family? And, you know, I answered a bunch and then a couple minutes later I looked at her. They were coming so quickly. I said, do you mind my asking? She looks so young. Do you have a child? She was like, oh no. I said, well, are you thinking about having a child soon? And she just started laughing. She's like, oh, I just graduated from college. I don't even have a boyfriend. <laughs> but what was interesting is she was asking me all these questions, and she was making decisions in her current career about them. And what I said to her is, I've seen this so often. I promise there will be time for hard decisions, for hopefully the men here as well as the women. There will be a time when you have to figure out what you can do with children. There will be a time when you have to figure out what you do as a parent, what you do as a professional. But that time is not now for almost all of you. And if you start out leaning back, you do not have the options. And I think it's really important for us all to understand that 70% of mothers in the United States and increasingly around the world work full time. So this is about, are you going to get paid the same as the men you're sitting next to? Leaning in is about giving yourself the option of having equal opportunity. And then if you want to step back, I fully support that. Lean in fully supports that. We just want you to do it then, not years in advance for a child, for a child you don't yet have. The world is not going to tell the women in this audience that you can do what men can do. I talk about careers sometimes as a marathon. You know, you get to the front, start off. Women are equally trained as well as men. The gun goes off. What are the voices the men hear? Keep going. You can do this. It's very important. This is your, you know, career. From the very beginning, women hear very different voices. They hear, you sure you want to do this? Should you even start a marathon you may not finish? Don't you want kids one day? As the marathon continues, the voices for the men grow louder. You've got this. Keep going. And the voices for the women, voices for the women grow louder too. Are you sure you should be working when your child needs you at home? A question that's insulting in an economy where almost everyone needs to work. And so... I've asked men and women around the world, professional men and women, if you're a man, raise your hand as a man. If anyone's ever said to you, should you be working? I have never gotten a hand, ever, in any audience in any country in the world. I say to women, raise your hand. If someone's ever said to you, should you be working? And all the hands go up. Similarly to men, raise your hand if you've ever been told you're too aggressive at work. 5%. As a woman, particularly senior women, raise your hand if you've ever been told you're too aggressive at work and all the hands go up. And so you are not going to get the right messages. Ignore them. <laughs> Ignore them. Really believe in yourselves. Understand that you have options and you have choices and don't limit yourself. You may choose to make different decisions later on, 
Let's start out really leaning in. The other thing I really want to say is don't do this alone. As a man coming into the workforce, as a woman coming into the workforce, whatever your background is, whatever, whatever challenges you face, don't go it alone because no one does anything alone. We also don't necessarily always need an older mentor to tell us what to do. In my life, they're great, but in my life history, my mentors advised me not to go to Google and not to go to Facebook. They thought Google was going away and they didn't really understand the Facebook thing. And if I had to listen to them, I wouldn't be here. And so your peers can be really effective. Probably the most important thing Lean In does is we help form Lean In circles. Small groups, we suggest 10, but it can be any group amount you want, who get together to meet once a month on a program that we've, that we've designed. You can use the program, you cannot use the program. All that matters is you get together with a group of people and you commit to whatever ambitions you have together. And you check in regularly together so that you are going through this process, not by yourself, but with the support of people. I've had a chance to meet with our circles now all over the world, and I met last week uh, with eight women in a circle in Dublin, Ireland. And they're all 22 to 24, and they've all been in this circle for a year, and they've met religiously every three weeks for a year. And it's been amazing. Four of them have gotten raises, five of them have changed their jobs, and all of them said that they're approaching their careers differently because they're checking in with that circle every week, every, every three weeks. And so be ambitious, lean in, and lean in together. Rachel Thomas, Lean In President. As Cheryl said, you have so many exciting and important decisions in front of you. Who your partner will be, what your career will be like, what type of leader you'll become. Based on the book Lean In for Grads, which we released earlier this month, the team at Lean In pulled together our 10 favorite tips for graduates. We hope, like the book, they offer you some inspiration and some helpful practical advice as you embark on your career. If you spend any time at Facebook's offices, you'll see there's posters everywhere. And one of them reads, proceed and be bold. And that's our first tip. Adopt the mantra, proceed and be bold, for both your job search and your career. And this is so important for women. Men will apply for a job when they meet 60% of the criteria. For women, 100%. Ask yourself, who's more likely to get the job? The man who applies for it or the woman who doesn't? Exactly. <laughs> so don't wait until you meet 100% of the criteria. Tell yourself you'll learn as you go because you will and jump right in. Apply the same principle at work. Be bold. Tell your supervisor, I'm up for stretch assignments. Look for projects that will allow you to make a mark. Several years ago, I was an executive at a social gaming company. We hired two dozen recent graduates to join our client service team. Six months later, about half of them were still in client services. The other half had moved on into the organization into bigger, meatier jobs. And to a person, the difference was they had gone to another team and asked to take on a project, and they had told their manager explicitly, I want to move up. This makes a difference. Tip two, shift from a what do I get to a what can I offer mindset. Too often, particularly recent grads, are focused on what the company is going to do for them. Do not fall into this trap. We see it all the time. Instead, focus on what you can do for the company, how you can add value. Be explicit about your enthusiasm for joining. A mindset shift like this can make a big difference. It can make you stand out. In addition, at every step in your job search, look for opportunities to make a good impression. I'll give you two ideas. One related to your resume. Years ago, I ran a staffing agency that specialized in placing recent college grads. We saw so many mistakes on resumes that we eventually did an audit and discovered 98% of resumes had at least one error on them. That's 98%. Proof your resume fanatically. Ask a friend to do it. There is no excuse not to have an error-free resume. And when you're interviewing, 
Look for opportunities to go above and beyond what's expected. There's a great book, I mean a great story in Lean In for Grads about a girl who went for an interview right out of school. There was a big delay between her first meeting and her second meeting. She could have sat idle, but instead she read all of the company's marketing materials, put recommendations in the margins, and at the very end of the day she handed the marketing materials off to the most senior person and said, I had some downtime throughout the day. I have some ideas. I've left them for you. I hope they're helpful. She got the job and later found she was the most inexperienced of all the candidates. Now, that's an extreme example, but look for little ways that you can stand out. And remember, as millennials, you're experts on social media almost automatically. You know what millennials think. Bring that value. Step three, negotiate wisely. The wage gap starts right away. According to one study, girls right out of school, women right out of school make 82 cents for every dollar a man makes. And one of the main reasons is women are four times less likely to negotiate than men. And this has an impact on both your finances and your career progression. Think for a second. If a woman accepts a $25,000 starting salary, and one of her male counterparts pushes for more and gets $30,000. By the time they're 60, he'll have made $360,000 more if nothing else changes. And this isn't just about money. According to another study, employees who negotiate get promoted 17 months faster on average than employees who don't. You don't get what you don't ask for, so make it a role to negotiate. But for all the women watching, please understand gender stereotypes before you do. We expect men to be assertive. We expect them to look out, expect them to look out for themselves. So when they negotiate even fiercely, it's exactly what we expect them to do. Women, we expect women to be collaborative and communal. So when women stick up for themselves and push for more, they often face some pushback, and we all do this. We're here today because we want to change these stereotypes, but in the meantime, one of the things women can do is use communal language. When you negotiate, focus less on yourself as an individual and how you relate to your team and to your organization. For example, if you ask for more money, you might say, if I join the team, I do my best to make us successful. It's important my salary reflects the skills and education that I'll be contributing. Move from I language to we language. We have a great resource on this. One of the new the chapters in the new book is on negotiation by a woman named Kim Keating. She just did a live stream event much like this one where she talked about her four tips and answered questions. Highly recommend that you check it out. Tip four is break long-term goals into short-term steps. Think back to when you were a kid and you wanted to climb a tree and you looked up all the way to the top and thought to yourself, how will I possibly get up there? But then you just got started and you went branch over branch. And before you knew it, you were much higher than you thought you could get. That's the way to think about goals versus short-term steps. A good short-term step is concrete and measurable. You can actually answer the question, did I do it? You can achieve it in the next 12 to 18 months. And it's a stretch for you, but not too far of a stretch. It should scare you a little, but not so much. There's a risk you won't do it. We have a woman on our team named Nicole Stiffel who runs social media for us. Her goal is to have a major gallery exhibit of her artwork in New York. Her short-term step this year, every month she's doing a new art piece of artwork. And at the end of the year, she's going to host a friends and family exhibit of her work. That is a very actionable short-term step towards a much bigger, bolder goal. And no matter what your goals are, stay flexible and open to new experiences. Research tells us women are less likely to take risks, and that tends to hold us back. If an opportunity comes across your transom and it's going to help you build your toolkit, do it. Because ultimately, the more skills you have, the more likely you are to reach all of your goals. Tip five is my favorite, sit at the table. 
It is hard to feel confident early in your career, and it's particularly hard for women. Men tend to overestimate their performance, and they remember it slightly better than it was. <laughs> women, on the other hand, tend to underestimate our performance and remember it slightly worse than it was. When men are successful, innate skills, of course they did it. When women are successful, we, honest, we often point to external factors like luck and help from others. You can't change the way you feel, but you can change the way you think and act. When you walk into a meeting and you don't feel confident, take a deep breath and remind yourself you've earned the right to be there. Sit at the table, use your voice, and I'm willing to bet you'll surprise yourself. And when you have a challenge come across, think to yourself, women, think the man next to me, he probably thinks he can do it. And guess what? He's probably right and you can do it too. The more you fake it and act like you're confident, the more confident you'll feel. And with confidence becomes more, comes more opportunities. We have two great videos related to this. One is literally on confidence and how to act confidently even when you don't feel confident inside. And the other is how to accept feedback and really progress in your career, both by PwC, and I highly recommend you check them out. Tip six is all about listening to your inner voice. As you move from college to your career, that little voice inside your head, you all hear it, that tells you what you really think can serve as a powerful guide. Sure, you're going to hear opinions and voices from other people around you, your friends, your parents, your coworkers, your professors, and they're important, but don't let them drown out your voice. As you start to really listen to it, you'll be surprised how it helps you answer questions and begin to really forge your own path. Tip six is about mentorship. We are told, go get a mentor, get a mentor. And often what happens is recent graduates in particular are so focused on this, it's almost as if they're walking up to every more senior coworker in contact and saying, will you be my mentor? If you have to ask, Sadly, the answer is probably no. Research tells us mentors select protégés based on their potential and their performance. So instead of thinking to yourself, if I get a mentor, I'll excel, start thinking, if I excel, if I do my job well, I'll get noticed and I'll get a mentor. Unfortunately, it's a little harder for women to find mentors right now. We're all here because we want to change it. But men naturally gravitate towards men, human nature, and there are more men in leadership roles. So women sometimes miss out. The good news is, and Cheryl already spoke about this, we know from research peer input can be just as valuable. Over 30 years of social science research tells us we're more confident in groups, we learn better in groups, and we can achieve more in groups. So highly recommend you check out our Lean In Circles. We're on over 300 campuses. We're going to do a big campus push in the fall, and we're also in communities all across the country. And I really believe that joining a circle can make a big difference. Almost daily, we hear a story from someone in one of our circles who asked for something they wouldn't have, went for an opportunity they wouldn't have because of the support of their circle. Tip eight. Understand and challenge gender bias. For women, it's a bit of a balancing act between being seen as confident and being seen as well-liked. If you're very confident, often not so well-liked. Very, very nice, often seen as a little less competent. And the tricky part is you need to assert yourself to be effective but yet you know that there's going to be some pushback, a little bit of a social penalty when you do. And this really matters. Ask yourself, who's more likely to get promoted? The man with high marks across the board or the woman with equally high marks but is just not quite as well liked? We're working to change this, but in the meantime, the good news is awareness begets fairness. 
And there are things all of us can do to make a difference. The first is, women, you can advocate and support other women. Every time you say, well, that woman had a good idea, or you celebrate another woman's accomplishment, not only is it good for you, your status in the group also rises. It's a win-win. In addition, all of us can look for and push back against the language of what we call the likability penalty. If you heard a woman called assertive, too ambitious, out for herself, ask, what exactly did she do? And then, if a man did the same thing, would you feel the same way? You'll likely hear no. We talked about this a bit. Tip nine is about partnership. It may not seem like it now, but one of the most important career decisions you'll make is who your partner is. And if they're committed to equality and committed to supporting you, male or female, it will make a big difference in your career. And 50-50 is good for everyone. Research tells us that couples that split housework and childcare evenly have lower divorce rates. Children with involved fathers do better across the board. Emotionally, academically, they even have better careers. And if that's not compelling enough, 50-50 couples are happier and have more sex. <laughs> So, date whomever you'd like, but when it comes down to time to settle down, look for someone who's truly committed to being an equal partner. And finally, last but not least, don't leave before you leave. We've talked about this a lot, so I'll just wrap up with, keep that foot on the gas. The more you do, the more opportunities you'll have, the more flexibility you'll ultimately have, and you can make a truly informed decision on the day you make it. Very quickly, you're probably thinking to yourself, what can I do now? Two things you can do. If you go to leanin.org forward slash grads, you'll find all these 10 tips as well as resources. Articles you can read, videos you can watch, tools you can use as you transition from undergrad into the workplace. In addition, we're currently hosting a number of live stream events just like this one with our partners at PwC. The next one is next Wednesday at 7 p.m. It's with Kanal Modi, who wrote one of the chapters in the new book. It's called Man Up and Lean In. And finally, I can't emphasize this enough how excited we are about circles and how big a difference we think they can make. At leanin.org forward slash campus, you'll find lots of information about starting a circle or joining a circle that's already on your campus, and we really hope you'll join us. Thank you so much. And good luck with everything and lean all the way in. <laughs> and now we're going to switch to Q&A. Thank you, Rachel and uh, Cheryl for that uh, great conversation and dialogue around uh, tips, uh, the top 10 tips in terms of career transitions uh, for women. And Cheryl, your opening comments and inspiration from the overall lean in and, and why you started this were fantastic. Uh, so we'd like to get into some Q&A. And what we'd like to do first is we've got a question coming from a special guest, Cheryl. And that is our U.S. senior partner, Bob Moritz, <laughs> who's uh, hosting a live event today at Penn State. So he'll be doing a you know dialogue following this webcast. And his question is as follows. As a future employee, how should I weigh the concepts of diversity and inclusiveness into my decisions about the career I choose and the organizations I may want to join after college? That's a great question. I think we know we know what the data says very clearly, which is that organizations that have more diversity, particularly in leadership ranks, but they're out make better decisions and do better, they perform better. So I think as you look for where you're joining, you want to look for places that you're exciting about what they do, you want to look for growth opportunities, but you also want to look for places that really value diversity because you know they're going to do better as well as be better better places to work. So I think it's a really big deal. Great, thank you. And now we'd like to turn to the live audience here at uh, Facebook. And we are really thrilled, if you look at this group, to have men and women in this audience. So thank you, men, for leaning in uh, to this conversation with us today. Sure. For any man at any of these events, uh, Gloria Steinem says that if you attend just one, 
won such event, you got to pass when the inevitable revolution happens. So this is <laughs> a very good use of an hour. A very high return. But now they're thinking, Cheryl, it was really good that I chose to get up at 3 a.m. in the morning right. to get here. That's right. It's a very high return. I also have been known when asked by women how to find the right men to date for those who are dating men, to say, like, you should date the men who come to events like this. <laughs> They've self-selected into being, you know, great partners. So there are a lot of benefits to being a man on this call. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. So we ran a contest uh, and the last month for to, to get people to figure out how could they be here live to ask questions. So uh, people were asked to submit uh, photos on our PDBC U.S. Careers Facebook site and to the theme of capturing what do you aspire to. And we then had people vote on what the best photo was in order to win an all-expense-paid trip to participate live in this event. And I'm very excited to have our next question come from the winner of that contest. Okay. So with that, can I turn it over to you to share our next question? Yeah. Hi, Cheryl. My name is Chahidi Bunsell, and I'm actually from Penn State, so I'm very excited that Bob is there. Um, so basically a little bit about my photo. Um, I took it a few summers ago in Beijing, and um, I saw a man sitting on the ground. He didn't have any arms, and he was writing these intricate, beautiful Chinese symbols um, in paint with his feet. Wow. And that just inspired me so much because it showed how how much of a positive thing he made out of an obviously unfortunate event. Um, and that's a photo I submitted to Aspire to Lead. Um, so this question comes from the UAE, and it's, what advice would you give to women in college who don't really know what they want to do with their career yet? Okay. Well, Cheryl talks in the book about your career being a jungle gym. And we talked a little bit today about being open to new opportunities, just kind of moving as you see opportunities as long as you're building your skill set, you're always on a good path. My joke is that my career has been on different playgrounds. It hasn't even been on the same jungle gym. And, and again, I think if you're always challenging yourself and doing things that you're passionate about, you will find your way to a career that's really fulfilling. I think one of the challenges we have is that it's a hard economy. It's a hard economy everywhere. And we want people to be really ambitious and have big dreams, men and women, for what they want to do. That doesn't mean your early jobs will have that. And it doesn't mean any job will have that. Any job, mine today, Rachel's today, all of ours, has some good and some bad and some things we love and some things we, we don't. We talk a lot, both at Lean and about Facebook, about playing high and playing low. I have a poster in my office here in my conference room, and it has like these two really dirty hands. And it says... The future belongs to those of us still willing to get our hands dirty. I know when we're hiring at Facebook from an every level, mine all on down, is we're looking for people who are going to do real work. So, you know, I do sales calls for Facebook and I do them regularly all the time. I don't just leave that to what is a very big sales team I run, but I do it myself. And I do it myself because I stay in touch with our clients. I stay in touch with our, pro our product needs. I know we're always looking to hire people who are willing to do the hard work. And so every job doesn't have to be perfect. And you're going to have to roll up your sleeves no matter what you do. But you can find enough in whatever roles you can get to learn and grow and get uh, to where you're trying to go. So. I think that's really great advice. And if you think about even the comment, Rachel, you made earlier as well, really establishing yourself and demonstrating that you can really do something helps you get mentors, advocates, and sponsors later on. So great, great advice. Um, our next question comes from someone with an extreme uh, background, and she started college at the age of 16. Wow. So I had an opportunity to meet with all of our question answers, uh, askers last night, and believe me, they are phenomenal people. So here you go. Next one. Hi, Cheryl and Rachel. My name is Aisha. I was born and raised in Nigeria, and I've been living in Nairobi, Kenya for the past five years. In our more collective African societies, parents strongly influence what their children study. Science and engineering tend to be considered the most useful majors. I was wondering what advice would you give to young women like me who want to convince their parents that leadership and entrepreneurship are valuable studies to pursue, especially in business? Well, the first thing I would say is that I think uh, everyone's right about science and technical degrees. <laughs> I really, I really want to say that clearly is that, you know, 
and particularly for women, you know, women are 13% of computer science majors in the United States today. They were 35% in 1980s, and those trends are happening everywhere. And technical skills are really important, and it's never too late to have them. But even if you're, you know, a junior or senior in college, take a coding class. It is not going to hurt you, and I really believe those are really, are really valuable. Um, I think we will always value people who are entrepreneurial. I think we will always value uh, people who can make a contribution. And so I think no matter what you study, you can definitely have those skills. But I also think it's really important to, to learn some of the hard skills while you're in school because they'll help you. Great advice. And our next question uh, also comes from someone with a very di diverse experiences as well. So uh, it's next up for you. <laughs> okay. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Rachel. My name is Alejandra, and I was born in Mexico. Um, your book was actually given to my sister as a graduation gift when she graduated from medical school. And after she was done reading it, she shared it with my sister as she entered law school. And then they passed it on to me as I entered undergraduate. So my question <laughs> is, um, how have you seen your messages resonate in different ways across all professions and industries? So... You know, what's been amazing since the book was not just people reading it, which is great, but really people taking real action to change their lives. So everywhere I go, CEOs telling me, you're costing me so much money. <laughs> because all the women want to get paid what the men will get paid. And to them, I say, I'm not sorry at all. But more importantly, women, women like you. Women believing they can study whatever they want, believing they can have great careers, believing they can have families and great careers, and taking steps to all the things Rachel said, sit at tables where they would otherwise sit in the back apply for jobs, raise their hand, push back when they're told they're bossy or aggressive, help everyone understand that women can and have the same trajectory men can have. Again, probably the thing we've been most excited about is the pickup in circles. We're at almost 16,500 in 72 countries, and they're very active across college campuses. We have 310 campuses. And the way these circles happen is just like careers happen, person by person. One person, sometimes a man, often a woman, will usually start out and form one. On a lot of these 310 campuses, we have campus leaders, person or two or three who stands up like, I'm going to organize this for my campus, and they start those circles. We also see them in companies. And what we're seeing is actually even the process of starting and running and moderating those circles is often an entry-level kind of leadership role that someone takes on. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, someone who wasn't leading anything is leading something on their campus. Or we see young women within companies getting noticed and promoted because all of a sudden people are looking to them, to them as leaders. And so again, no one does this alone. And so I think the best thing we can do to ensure people's career trajectory is get them into small groups where they're working on it together. So I really encourage people to take that step and join or start a circle because it'll make a big difference. And it's not just for women, it's for men. There are circles of all men. There's a circle at Harvard Business School for Asian American men because someone read the book and said, these are all the same issues or very similar issues uh, that women face, that we face. And he wanted to talk about those. And there are lots of circles that are co-ed, which have a lot of benefits, as I've already discussed. But, <laughs> but this isn't just about women taking care of their careers and trying to get to equality. It's about men taking care of their careers and having equality be part of that trajectory. I was just going to say, one of the yeah. things I love about the book, um, obviously highly biased, but I, I recently had my aunt, she's 65, visiting, and I went through the 10 tips with her. And she said, oh my gosh, these are things like I have felt, like I've kind of intuitively started to realize over the years, if I had only known earlier that like there's research behind this, like the stereotypes and the bias are real, like what I'm experiencing is very universal, that that would have been so helpful to her. So it's one of the things I love about Lean In for Graduates and the original Lean In, it's just shining a light that a lot of the things that men and women are experiencing are research-based, these are real issues, and we can work together to overcome them. Great question. It's funny, you had mentioned earlier and now shared about the story about your aunt. And while I'm not 65 uh, yet, uh, I can... Someday, someday. That's right. That's the good news. I could really relate to what your aunt had to say. And as a first-generation college graduate, having the opportunity to have some tips to learn from others as you enter the workforce, it's really an opportunity that we should all be taking advantage of. Um, our next uh, questioner comes from China. So, uh, Sherlyn, here you go. 
Hi Cheryl, hi Rachel. My name is Shirling. I'm from China and I grew up in Singapore. Um, so I'm currently a junior and I'm trying to make some of the major decisions in my life. So I'm just curious how you guys make some of your most important decisions. I said this already and this is really true for me. It's, it's going to be different for different people. Um, for me, it's always been a lot less about the job or the title and much more about, did I feel challenged? There's always grunt work to be done, to be clear, but <laughs> did I feel challenged? Did I think I was picking up new skills? Did I feel good going to work every day? And again, you don't every day, but overall, did I feel good about what the organization was job. doing? I, this is actually the job <laughs> where um, I feel fabulous going to work every day. Um, and so for me, a lot about is if I'm gathering skills and I feel relatively good and passionate about the work I'm doing, I know that I'm on the right course. But again, that's the answer for me, and I know people have different priorities depending on kind of what you're looking for. I advise people in Lean In to have a long-run dream and a short-term plan and not to try to map it out. So one of the advice I would give you is what I would not do is try to map out, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, because you'll get it wrong and you'll miss opportunities, particularly ones that are riskier. So if I had tried to map out my career the day I graduated from college, I could not be here at Facebook because there was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> and Mark was, I mean, you know, in elementary school. <laughs> I, but, but it's actually a funny joke, but that, that is real. So what I see people doing is trying to map too carefully the first step to the second to the third. The world is going to change on you, and if you have to map that out, you're going to miss opportunities. What I would say instead is, you know, have a general direction of where you want to go. So if you want to be a doctor, you need to go to med school. If you want to be a lawyer, you need to go to law school. If you don't want to be a doctor, don't go to med school. And, <laughs> and actually, just that one thing is really important. I can't tell you how many people I meet who are in graduate school or training programs, and I say, great, what kind of lawyer do you want to be? And they say, I don't want to be a lawyer. I say, well, why are you in law school? And so I actually think mapping out like a long-run dream and taking steps that make sense, make, make real sense, and then do something you're excited about that you think will grow where you can learn. Literally, something you think is growing, something you're excited about where you can learn, and don't try to map from here to there. Thank you. I love all our international question answers. So great. Yeah. Nice. It's so great to have you guys. It is. Uh, so we have time, I think, for a few more questions. So we're going to go around for another round. And I think you're next up. <laughs> Okay, so you guys obviously stress the importance of lean in circles and how important they are, but how effective do you really think they are on college campuses? And how can a student like me um, start a circle or encourage women to start one? So we launched lean in on campus last fall. It was our first foray in an organized way onto university campuses. And we're amazed by the interest. We're on over 300 campuses, and as I said, we're going to do another big push this fall. It is so easy to get involved. If you go to leanin.org forward slash campus, you can find the campus community on your campus. Start one if there isn't. On many campuses, there are. You can look for existing circles. Start your own. Cheryl mentioned this earlier. We provide what I would call kind of a recipe book for your circle. And like any good recipe, you could take pieces you like, you know, discard pieces you don't, and really make your circle your own. But go to the site, lean.org forward slash campus, poke around a little bit, look for a circle on your campus or start one, and we will give you everything that you need to feel supported. And we have a woman on our team who's a you know day-to-day -day contact for all of our campus circles, really trying to offer you the everything that you need to be really, really successful. And we can't talk enough about how much we think they're driving change. As I said, almost every day we get an email with an amazing story about someone who went and did something they wouldn't have done if it wasn't for that extra nudge from their circle. I think the reason circles work or any group where you're being explicit about your goals is that if you actually think about it, we don't really make commitments about our ambitions or our goals that are explicit said out loud. It's hard to talk about. Even with close friends, when we're with close friends, we often talk about more personal things, right? And you don't really have a place other than in your own head where you're saying, here's what I want to do and here's why. And so giving yourself a place to be really explicit about that but then support each other. So for example, 
some of our circles on campuses are doing mock interviews for each other as they prep, prep for going, going to job interviews or helping each other find people who have worked in industries so they can get the knowledge they need before an interview or watching the negotiation video we offer and then doing practice negotiations. Having a set group of people to do that type of thing with makes it so it's not the kind of thing you never get around to doing and makes a really big difference. Okay, so having a sense of community and talking with each other and supporting each other is really a big concept that I'm hearing from an overall uh, perspective to help you get ahead. And I think also, Cheryl, just so that you that learning together. Yes, right. You know, adult learning theory is we learn better as group, as in a group environment as adults talking about things, so bringing people together to learn together. And we do offer a lot of educational content on leanin.org, and more and more of it is for folks who are just at their point, same point in their life, in their life that you are, moving from campus into their careers. Great. Thank you. Our next question. Cheryl, women are obviously very interested in your messages. How can we get more men to join the conversation and lean into? It's such an important question. I never wanted the book or the organization to be only for women and tried to be explicit about that up front. It's definitely about equality and it definitely starts from a place of gender. So women have obviously been really involved. But men getting involved, everyone from Bob Moritz as PWC all the way, all the way through to men on campus have really mattered. In the new book, Lean In for Graduates, Kunal Modi writes a piece, and he talks about why as a millennial man, he, he, millennial men, millennial man, he just, <laughs> a lot, millennial, um, he just graduated from Harvard Business School a few years ago, and he talks about how he thinks it's so important. I think the best way to get men involved is to help them understand that they shouldn't get involved as a favor to someone else. They should get involved because mm -hmm. it's good for them. So as he writes... Not just if you're a CEO, if you're an entry-level man doing a job in any organization of any kind, if you can work better with half the population, and in those early jobs it does, have, it does tend to be half and half, you're going to outperform mm -hmm. because you're going to do better because you can do that. And so really being able to work better with women and help them overcome these biases is not just increasing his team's performance, but it's increasing his. As you go on in your career, that becomes increasingly true. On the personal front, again, men who come to these events totally improves their social lives. <laughs> but it's actually a serious conversation. Children with more active fathers, no matter how active a mother is, no matter what income level they're at, do better at everything. Better emotionally, better in school, better professionally. And marriages, partnerships between men and women where they're more equal are in better shape. Now, for those of you who date, you know, men dating men or women dating women, you're actually in pretty good shape on the whole 50-50 thing. <laughs> because it turns out that Sinova, this is interesting, because same-sex couples actually split things much more evenly on average. Mm -hmm. It's where gender comes into play. And it's not perfect, obviously, there's some differences, but it's where gender comes into play that those assumptions just kick in, that children are a woman's responsibility and not a man's, which make no sense in a world where women are also working full-time. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, socially for men, getting involved is going to lead to happier life, better partnerships, stronger marriage if you choose to get married, and better, you know, better, better results for your children, which I think all parents want. So, thank you. Great, that's fantastic advice. And as an organization, PwC, by 2016, I'm really struck by your comment on millennials. We will be 80% millennials. So that. Having that fact, right, to help people think about how can I really get engaged is really important. Yeah. I think we have time for one, one last question. And so I'm going to go over to Alejandra. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this question comes from the web. What are the most important steps women can take to support each other as we enter the workforce? Well, one of the things I mentioned earlier is women advocating other women is very powerful. So not only when you support another woman or celebrate her success does she look better, it actually makes you look like more of a leader within the group as well. And it, it's hard for women to promote ourselves. If we overly promote ourselves, there can be some pushback. But you can celebrate other women as openly and aggressively as you'd like. Um, in fact, I recommend getting a, a work buddy as well, which is, you know, someone who you tell each other what your goals are, you push each other. Maybe even in meetings you have little signals like speak up a little bit more or, you know, go for it, but really get someone who you're you're teaming up with to help you as you push through your career. And then we've said it so many times, but 
getting together as a small group and discussing the issues that you're facing can be very powerful. I've been struck by how many circles I've been invited to participate in where a young woman tells a story and you can tell she feels very alone, like she's the only person dealing with this or she's the only person thinking about it. And the rest of the circle says, oh my God, I had something just like that happen or I've had the very same experience and they're learning from each other and each other's shared experiences. And so I think that can be incredibly powerful as well. And then also just educate. As I mentioned, my aunt's 65. A lot of the things that we all experience related to bias, there's so much written. If you go read, it's amazing how much you learn. And it, a lot of the things are very easy to sidestep. As we said, you know, awareness begets fairness. Great, thank you. So it's a perfect note to end on. Uh, thank you to PwC for organizing this. Thank you for all of you who are coming. And please know that change happens person by person, that if we get to equality, it will be this generation, the lean-in generation that does this. And that means each and every one of you. So as you take a step forward, as you as a man speak out for a woman or speak out for yourself, as you as a woman take a job, reach for an opportunity, you do this not just for yourselves, but you do this for all the women who are, who are aside, for, right next to you, and all the women who will follow. So we're grateful for all you're doing. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you, so much. Thank you Rachel. Thank you, Cheryl, for engaging in this, in this terrific conversation today. And I want to say thank you as well for everyone who's participated live in the studio with us today and on the broadcast. Um, at this event is actually being translated into five different languages so that this conversation can continue well beyond the live broadcast today. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you again for the terrific insights, the great, fabulous questions. And I hope that all of you that are uh, ready to embark on your conversations on campus around uh, the globe are uh, going to have a really fulsome, robust conversation today. So thank you again. <laughs> Here we are, inseparable.